Welcome to the Psych Central Show, where each episode presents an in-depth look at issues from the field of psychology and mental health, with host Gabe Howard and co-host Vincent M. Wales. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of the Psych Central Show podcast. My name is Gabe Howard, and with me, as always, is Vincent M. Wales. And before we meet this week's great guests, I want to tell you about a bipolar schizophrenic and a podcast that I host with the spectacular Michelle Hammer. That's right, one podcast is not enough for me, I need two. And unlike this show, we don't feature guest experts, but we do cuss a lot. It's a vulnerable look into the lives of two people living with mental illness. Please listen to a bipolar, a schizophrenic, and a podcast at psychcentral.com slash BSP or on your favorite podcast player. Well, that, that sounds like more fun than this. Can I do that now? No. Oh, all right. Well, in that case, let's introduce our guests. With us today are Reverend Emma Chatton and her wife, Heather James. Welcome, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. We are here to talk about issues of mental health in the transgender community, which in, in my mind has to be a, a very, very big issue. Would I be wrong in, in assuming that? No, no, it is something of concern. It can be difficult if you find yourself in a life where you realize that your world is upside down and you need to do some major things to correct the way you interface with the world if you're not the person you know yourself to be. It's a major life trauma, uh, a rebirth, as it were. Give us some background. How did, uh, how did it all go for you guys? Well, I knew about my issues for a long time. I was born in the 50s, so I'm a little older. I found out it was something society didn't talk about, so I kept it buried for a long time. I hurt my back in my late 30s and realized that with a lot of coping mechanisms I'd been doing, alcohol and similar things, it really wasn't something I could continue. And I decided that I had to get to the root of the matter. I had to be honest and drop the whole facade I've lived my whole life with and get real about it and go through things and correct the way I dealt with the world. Uh, Basically, I stopped presenting as a man, which was a pretense, and I took on my inner self, which was the woman I'd been all along. And it took a while to go through adolescence at almost age 40. It takes a while to adjust. It's a new life, but... uh, um, it's gone quite well. It's been well over 25 years now, so it's a good thing. Fantastic. How about you, Emma? I knew uh, a long time ago, as a matter of fact, it's kind of like, you know, when, when does anybody know who they are? I, I always knew who I was. It was just that the rest of the world didn't. Uh, and so it, uh, it took me a while. And, of course, that's something that we didn't talk about then. So mm-hmm. um, you know, the, my parents didn't want to talk about it, and you know, I just kind of buried it until I went through adolescence and felt like my body betrayed me, and I, I went on and tried to live my life as best as I could. But many, many individuals in our community reach a point of kind of do or die, where it really becomes a necessity, and that happened for me probably just after after I was thirty, and so I went through my transition then, and it's been over twenty years. And there are days that I don't even think about it. I know that a lot of people listening to the show might be curious as to what exactly being transgendered means. So my question would be, can you explain transgendered or being transgendered to a population or to a person who might not be familiar with the term? Basically, it's the knowledge that your external image does not match your internal feelings. So I might have looked like a boy for a good part of my life, but that didn't feel proper to me. It wasn't who I was. It wasn't who I felt like. How I behaved wasn't perceived properly. There's a lot of socialization differences between men and women. And if you're socializing and you're presenting in a female fashion, but you don't appear to be female, it's, it's awkward in your day-to-day life. There's, to say, I mean, if you're younger, there's bullying aspects to it. If you're a child in school, and bullying can go on well beyond 
school. I mean, if you're out and about, people will laugh and point and do things, and that can make your whole life upsetting. I think to try and explain, it's it's very complicated to try and explain that to someone who isn't, because my question is, what does it feel like to be you? I don't know what it feels like to be, um, I guess, to be not transgender, to be not who I am. To me, I'm amazed that people even turn out to to have their insides match their outsides in their body. Uh, to me, that's amazing. I don't know how that feels. I only know how I feel, and how I feel is very different from how most of the world feels, if that makes sense. It does, yeah. Now, Emma, I remember when we met at a presentation that you were giving, one of the things that you said that I thought was just wonderful was in response to everyone saying that, you know, we just want to understand, you said, yeah, so do we. <laughs> exactly. I think while it's, it's a genuine desire, I think it's kind of misplaced when people say, I want to understand, because quite frankly, we don't even understand ourselves. The best minds of medical science don't even understand. Uh, I think that, that the best that we can hope for is to accept because understanding isn't something I, I think that we can achieve because we don't understand ourselves. There's an element of faith to it. You know how you feel, you know the rest of it, and you just have to kind of go from that background that this is not a harmful thing, but I need to get through this. In, in many ways, it's a temporary state where you go through and you go through those changes and you change your name, and you change your appearance, and you change the way you present to the world, and then you go on with the rest of your life. And one of the things that happens sometimes to people in our community is this has been such an obstacle in their life. They go through, they do that, and then they have other things to take care of. This is not going to fix whether you didn't get your college degree or not having a good career path. This is still just that day-to-day -day aspect of relating to the world. You may have other issues you still get to work with. I think, I think Heather brings up a good point with regard to identity and how we identify ourselves, and I think that that's very important. I simply identify myself as a woman. None of us, when we grew up, said, I want to be transgendered when I grow up. Okay. We, we generally had that target gender that we wanted to be, and I simply identify as a woman, a woman of transgender history. Transgender is not who I am. It's what I had to go through in order to live my life authentically and be who I am. That makes sense. I, I, can, I can certainly understand that. I, I feel the same way when it comes to mental illness. I don't consider myself a person with bipolar disorder or a person not with it. I consider myself gay, but I just happen to have mental illness in my history, and it's something that I have to live with every day, but mostly I'm just me. Is that, am I... Am I equating those two things correctly? Well, I, I think so. I think so. It's, it's that we don't, we don't let that, that collection of, of things identify us. We, we are much bigger than those things. That's not our solitary identity. Exactly. I, I mean, like we have the transgender. We may have the gay. We may <laughs> have other issues added in that. And all of those are, you know, I like science fiction. I like certain <laughs> kinds of music. I tinker around with audio equipment. I have lots of things that make up who I am. Transgender is something that I went through. And yeah, there's a piece of it still hanging on. And I'm willing to share that with others because I want to lighten their load a little and show them, you know, this isn't the be all end of the world. You can get through this and you can have a great life. What would you say the, uh, the biggest differences are for those undergoing a transition today than, than when you too went through it. There's much more knowledge about this in the world. There's been, uh, shall we say, celebrities that have brought this to a more public attention. It's a blessing and a curse. It's not quite uh, as mysterious a thing, but, but people may get some jollies out of the whole idea, you know, from, like I say, from some of the celebrities that have done things. Obviously, most of us, we're not celebrities. We're just trying to have a, a decent quality of life. We're trying to have a reasonable job and a home and a career and, and try to balance that out with doing things in life that give value back to our life. You know, the unexamined life, is, is it worth living? So it's important that uh, 
people really kind of look at it that way and, and make the most of what they do get. I, I think that at least from my perspective is, is, again, it's much more conversational and it is uh, perhaps a bit less sensational. It is also less binary. When we transitioned, it really was moving from male to female, man to woman, woman to man. There's a lot more variability now uh, with regard to how we see gender and how we understand gender and to, to really kind of realize there's a constellation of genders between the two poles that we, uh, that we have. There's also a lot more options. When we transitioned, it was very much a surgical track and do this and do that. And actually, just prior to when we transitioned, if, uh, if the individual was going to transition, they would have to be able to transition really into a heterosexual life. In other words, if you were transitioning from a male to a female, you would have to like men. That was, that was your track. They weren't making any more gay people. The gatekeepers of the technology pretty much expected a very specific black and white male-female presentation. You were either one or you were the other. And if when you crossed over, uh, you were sort of expected to maybe not be Donna Reed, but pretty much have that kind of a presentation, you know, be the supportive wife and those kinds of things. And it was, you know, they, they hadn't caught up with Naomi Wolf and all the feminists yet. That was all a, a whole new world to them. And, you know, they were ivory tower folks, I think, the folks at Hopkins and some of the other scientists that had, had gotten a lot of this started. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp.com. Secure, convenient, and affordable online counseling. All counselors are licensed, accredited professionals. Anything you share is confidential. Schedule secure video or phone sessions, plus chat and text with your therapist whenever you feel it's needed. A month of online therapy often costs less than a single traditional face-to-face -face session. Go to BetterHelp.com forward slash Psych Central and experience seven days of free therapy to see if online counseling is right for you. BetterHelp.com forward slash Psych Central. I think there's many things that are confusing to the general population. And one of the things that the general population hears is that there's a psychological aspect to this. Like before any transitioning can occur, you have to pass a psych test and that that's very confusing. So can, can you talk on that for a moment? Why is there a psychological test? Is it, is it just a decision? And you can tell by the way that I'm asking the question that I'm very confused about this. So can you explain that a little bit? A lot of what happens is, is, at least at the period where I began mine in the early 90s, one of the first things that occurs, you have a general discussion and an, an analysis. They get an idea of how you feel and what you think of and what your perspective is. Because the next logical thing would be to start the hormone therapy. The hormone therapy is very powerful. These are very powerful drugs. They will change your perspective they'll change the way you see the world they'll change your body there's a lot going on there and it's important to know if you really have thought about this if you're serious about it it's not something to start upon lightly there is the process of, of having a therapist uh, is is important when i went through the the process it, it was not uh, a battery of tests i did take some tests but I, I think that they just wanted to have much more of a baseline uh, and, and to kind of make sure that I was prepared for all that I would have to go through, which is a lot. It is a lot of social stress, financial stress. It is family stress. The individual runs the risk of completely changing their lives, losing their job, their family, their, their social standing, all of their friends. So it, it does require a certain amount of, of fortitude to do that. What would you say was the single most difficult aspect of transitioning? Accepting that I could actually do it. When you spend your whole life and you look at yourself in the mirror, you want to do this and you want to have a quality of life and you want a good presentation. And sometimes it's hard to believe that other people would see you as you want to be seen. It's hard to imagine. It's like, oh, nobody would believe this. Nobody would perceive me to be a female. Now, I mean, 20-some years on, of course, it, it becomes easier to believe that. I've had such day-to-day -day reinforcement of that. But when you're first starting, it's hard to believe you can put your whole life upside down like that, and it'll work. 
I would agree with that. I think that that's I think that's very important. I think the the other kind of understated aspect to that too is is just getting on with life. For so many individuals, the transition becomes the full focus of everything that they do for so long, for so many years. And once they do it, it's kind of like, what's next? Also, the realization that transition is a lifetime. It is a lifetime process. So I think all of those rolled in together would be, would be the most difficult. That does make sense. I, I'd never really thought about that part of it before. The next question that I have is, how is it looked at scientific, and by it, how is, how is being transgendered or the transgender surgery looked at scientifically today versus how it was looked at 25 years ago? Yes, you've made a presumption. The presumption is that transgender people go through surgery. Not everybody does that, and that may not be as big a factor now as it was when we were starting this path. I, I think that that's a really good point. While it may be a goal for some individuals, some people simply want to live their life. And surgery may only impact an individual with their doctor and their lover. But with regard to the process, the process itself hasn't undergone many huge refinements. There's more doctors Um, available now. Although we do see some things on the horizon with regard to the transplantation of a womb. Actually, not long ago, they, I believe they did have the first male genital transplant. So there are things that are in the future as we move forward that may change surgically. But by and large, that doesn't affect everybody. We came from an era where this was a very different thing. There are a lot of children now that are younger, whose parents are more accepting, and they may go through puberty blockers and things like that when they're younger, and they may just ease across the line as they go through life. It may not be that big, dramatic, you got all the way to one physical role and then you have to go through great complications to get to the other one. We may be kind of the dinosaurs of what this is. We may be of that final era where people had to go through a big dramatic change. The younger generations may be more malleable and more fluid than we were. I I think Heather's right. The individuals who transition midlife may actually be a shrinking population, given that we are having individuals transition younger and younger pre-puberty, so that they actually don't have two distinct life arcs, like many in our generation who have a male life arc and a female life arc, or a female life arc and then a male life arc. Uh, You'll have kids who don't even go through puberty and who transition pre-puberty Transitioning midlife may be a, a, yeah, a dinosaur. So we have friends that, as they were struggling to find who they were, they joined the Marines, they joined the Army or the Navy to put that very hard emphasis on the role they were born into. And when that wasn't a magic cure-all, then they were forced with the fact that they had this dysphoria, they had this condition, And then they went through and did those changes in life. Well, first I want to say, do not consider yourselves dinosaurs, but pioneers, okay? (laughs) Okay, we'll accept that. Okay. Now, when I introduced you, I did say Reverend Emma Chatton. So how is it to be a woman of the cloth, so to speak, and being transgendered? I think that I, you know, I, I certainly have a unique perspective. One of the things that I take issue with, you know, our society has gendered God. If you take a look at the the Hebrew scriptures, and it's very clear, God does not have a gender. God is not a person in that sense. And if you look at Genesis 126 and 127, in our image, we made them, male and female, we made them. And so my God is totally genderqueer. My God is trans. My God is neither male nor female, similar to both, but unlike either. And I can't believe how we miss that. It it forms the basis of the patriarchy. If God is male, then male is God. And our society has gone down that road way too far. And I think if if there's anything really special about the, the trans and the gender communities, it's we're able to kind of explode that whole concept of gender. I think the way the gay and lesbian communities kind of did that with sexuality. That at least is my hope, and I see that as, uh, as, as being theologically sound and moving in a direction that we need to move in. 
the best question that I can think to ask is, what do you want society to know about being transgender? Because I know that there's a lot of misinformation out there being perpetrated, even accidentally. The big thing in my mind is people presume that we are abusive in one fashion or another, that we're something to be afraid of, that pull your children away, oh my goodness. You know, we're not that way more than anyone else. We're a broad mix of folks with all different kinds of aspects. And the majority of us just, you know, I mow the, I don't go to clubs at night. I mow the lawn. I, you know, I grow tomatoes out back. I mean, I'm, I'm probably the most boring person you might know. Otherwise, I just kind of want to get along and have a decent quality of life. But there is that whole presentation of, of trying to put the fear elements into this for folks who don't know us. It's all wrong. I, I think that there are two things for me that are that are important. And I think what Heather said, the fear element, uh, it, it's, it makes people uncomfortable, and I'd like to move beyond that. The whole issue of bathrooms is really ridiculous. That's gender policing. It has nothing to do with the trans community. I have stone butch lesbians that come to my church that have been gender clocked in the bathroom. What it's doing is it's saying that you don't look like a woman. So that's what we're facing with the bathroom issues. And the fact is, 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 you know, we just, we have to go. To deny an individual public bathrooms is to deny an individual to exist in public space. So I think that's something important to think about when we start thinking about bathroom issues. It's, we don't want these individuals in our public space and, and we need to move beyond that. The other thing is, is I work with lots of kids and I work with lots of parents and I, I want to, to at least try and reach out to that. If you have a child who you feel may be trans, talk about it. Begin to open those conversations. It's very important. If you take a look at the statistics with parental support for trans youth, with unsupported parents, 57% of the individuals will attempt suicide. With supported parents, 4%. Parental support is huge. And if you're having difficulty in supporting your trans child, reach out. If you don't know who to reach out to, reach out to me and I'll find you somebody in your area. This is, this is really important. Parents need to know that they're not alone and their kids simply need support. Their kids knew, know who they are. It's just a journey for the parents. So those are the two important things I'd say. I do understand what you're saying about the bathroom issue. I think it's very interesting you know, we talk about that we're doing this to, to protect people from sexual assault, but yet as we see in the media, when we actually, you know, convict people for sexual assault, we give them suspended sentences. When we, when we actually determine by a jury of their peers that they are dangerous, we, we give them two months because they're a very good swimmer. So when we have somebody in our midst, in our grasp, but has been proven to be a sexual predator, we don't really worry about it too much, but... In the bathroom, this one group of people, maybe that could have been in all of this, you know, conjecture and stereotyping and, you know, boogeymanning, uh, those are the people that we're worried about. We're actual proven sexual predators. We don't care about, we let them go or give them very light sentences. And that's, that's fascinating to me. You're absolutely right. We're not letting facts dictate our behavior. And what we want to do is we just want to go to the bathroom. That is absolutely it. One of my sermons was titled, Let My People Go. <laughs> That's all that we want to do. That's all um, anyone wants and, to do in the bathroom. It, exactly. And uh, I think the other stuff is just fear mongering. And I, and I think sometimes it boils down to what individuals have been taught. But I think wisdom is found somewhere between what we've been taught and what we learn. And so I think that it's always important for people to have an open mind and to be willing to learn new things and new ways of doing things. Wonderful. I thank you both very much for being on our show. It's been great. I hope you've had a good time. We have. Big fun. Thank you both for agreeing to be on the show. And thank you to everyone for tuning in. And remember, you can get one week of free, convenient, affordable, private online counseling anytime, anywhere by visiting betterhelp.com slash Psych Central. We will see everyone next week. Thank you for listening to the Psych Central Show. Please rate, review, and subscribe on iTunes or wherever you found this podcast. We encourage you to share our show on social media and with friends and family. 
Previous episodes can be found at psychcentral.com slash show. Psychcentral.com is the Internet's oldest and largest independent mental health website. Psych Central is overseen by Dr. John Grohall, a mental health expert and one of the pioneering leaders in online mental health. Our host, Gabe Howard, is an award-winning writer and speaker who travels nationally. You can find more information on Gabe at GabeHoward.com. Our co-host, Vincent M. Wales, is a trained suicide prevention crisis counsellor and author of several award-winning speculative fiction novels. You can learn more about Vincent at VincentMWales.com. If you have feedback about the show, please email talkback at psychcentral.com.